Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, you uh, you know that sometimes we have guests on the show? Uh, yeah, occasionally. It's been a hot minute. Definitely been a hot minute, but you know what? We actually have a returning guest on the show today. Please, everybody, welcome back to the program, Mike Myler. Mike! Hey, what's up? Good morning. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, been, it's been a little while since you were on the show. Uh, to talk about uh, Imperial Matchmaker and Giant Fire Chickens. That was fun. <laughs> mm, Toriju Goku, the Flaming Rooster. Yes. Still one of my favorite creatures that I've ever made. And I didn't make him. That was from that was a Buddhist hell thing. I just statted it. There you go. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. like, I just put stats to it. Uh, I learned way too much about Tanukis. Uh, so, hey, you know what? We all got something out of that conversation. <laughs> I'm really happy that you're able to come back. Uh, you have a new project that's, uh, that's going to be coming out uh, to crowdfunding soon. Uh, vast Cavia? I think so, yeah. Va- vast Cavia, yeah. The way that you had presented it to me was uh, that it is a, a primordial campaign for, like, uh, D&D 5e, but it's set in this, like, primordial landscape. What would you actually consider to be a primordial sword and sorcery campaign setting? What does that look like? Hyboria? Or hy- Hyperborea? I always get it wrong. Um, okay. Conan's World. Oh, shit. Okay. It's Hyboria, right? It's not Hyperborea? Probably. I'm going to go with that. It's, Hi, it's whatever you want it to be. It's everywhere you want to go. Yeah. So uh, if you ever watched uh, any of the Conan... There was the Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was uh, the Conan once upon a time. So that's probably the thing I'm most familiar Actually, with. Actually, did you ever see um, Fire and Ice by Ralph Bakshi? No. No? I don't think I've oh, seen that. Oh, you should. It's really good. It's really good. Uh, Ralph Bakshi was a, like an old school type animator uh, kind of in the, in the shadows of much bigger production companies. Uh, um, let me see. What did, what you probably saw the original Lord of the Rings movie. Did you oh, see that one? Like the cartoon from the seventies. Yeah, the the, the cartoon that one. is Ralph Bakshi. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yep. his style. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and he did a, a a sword and sorcery like primordial like caveman saves his cave woman movie called Fire and Ice that I I I really 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 dig and this is kind of like my my love letter to that sort of uh, classic fantasy. You know, it's funny because like when you say fire and ice, my initial thought, and I'm sure you get this a lot, is oh, do you mean a song of ice and fire? <laughs> because that's the initial no. thing that I think about. Well, I mean, north of the wall, I guess, that, that north of the wall would fit for Vascavia. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, and you also mentioned like Khal Drago, so like the horse lords, like the Dothraki, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. Yeah, they definitely do have that slight, like, Conan feeling to them. Blades and steel and magic is, like, truly a mysterious thing of witchery. Like, yeah, that's what we're... That's oh, what we're yeah. For. Some other examples that you give, too, like uh, Tarzan, Xena, Scorpion King, Beowulf. Those are all good things to pull from, though. I like all those archetypes. The book has a stat block for a Conan-like uh, barbarian thief and a master of the jungle. Uh, a la Tarzan. Oh. So if you wanted to include those characters, we got them. Okay. That more of like a druid? <laughs> if I'm a master of the jungle, do I control? Uh, actually, he's the, um, uh, I forget what the, so like I OGLified the uh, archetype. He's built as a barbarian of ninth level that is like, well, I had to change the, some of the, the, the names and stuff because you can, you can copyright uh, the words you use to express a, a game mechanic. But you can't actually copyright the game mechanic. Yeah, oh, okay. that's. So like, I think we've talked about that once or twice. A little um, bit, yeah. It, it really, really hard to copyright a mechanic because you can again wholesale lift the rules for a game as long as you don't plagiarize it. And they have not released any new rules for fifth edition's uh, systems reference document since the game came out. And even then, they didn't include a lot of the barbarian primal path. Yeah, uh, but I mean, again, then you can still take that wholesale as long as you don't take it word for word and you can copy it and it's like Correct. they really can't do anything oh yeah we right. so the the animalist he's listed as like an animalist archetype that's the path of the totem warrior barbarian. okay so it is a it's, it's a barbarian archetype that's sort of modified mm-hmm. to make it work for that yeah and then he's just built as a as a an npc ninth level barbarian and came out to challenge rating he's on the page challenge rating five I will totally take him on completely unprepared. <laughs> I used him as a pre-gen in Adventure once. It was really fun. Oh, yeah? 
Oh, that's nice. That's yeah, nice. he's mobile and quick, and he, he's got a, like a weird smattering of abilities. Like, yeah, no, it worked out. Even though it makes perfect sense for, you know, like a fantasy setting, at, like the, the primordial sword and sorcery kind of, of thing, uh, especially with like all of the fantastic references that you make to it, it's something that I don't really see very often utilized in quite this fashion. Why was this something that you wanted to uh, make? Well, there's there's two reasons to it. Mm. Um, first, uh, there's a book I made called 2099 Wasteland, okay, which is like my uh, my love letter to Fallout. The way it's built is this decentralized campaign setting, so like everybody's wasteland looks different, and whenever you find a new region, you roll a randomly to find out like what resources are there. Because it's it's ultimately a, a settlement building game for edition. hidden as a as a apocalyptic sci-fi campaign setting, and there are a bunch of warlords in the book, and uh, the backers of that campaign were like, "Please make another book of warlords," and they kept asking me, and I I did I didn't I didn't have it in me to do a whole nother book to support Twenty Nine and Wasteland because I thought it was already pretty much done. It was done. I, yeah. I made the book I need to make. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took a lot of the ideas I had for Twenty Nine Wasteland that didn't make the cut. Uh, for warlords, for various reasons, there was a voting process. And people really wanted to see apocalyptic Merlin, and they got apoc apocalyptic Merlin, but they didn't get some of the other things. Okay. Around January, I um just had like the notion, like, oh, you know, it'd be cool if the, the world was like, screw spellcasters, like there are no wizards. <laughs> There's just not enough knowledge around yet for wizards. Just ban the whole wizard class, and then like hmm. everybody else. There's a, if you if you are a spellcaster, there's a target on your back, and like, how would that change the dynamics of play? Wait, there's not already a target on spellcasters' backs because they're wimpy, oh, now wimpy, like, wimpy. Because they are they are wimpy until like fifth level, and they start to get fireball and fly. Well, I mean, physically wimpy. Yeah, you can run them through with a sword pretty easy, but and if if the world does not have a lot of magic, then the people who have access to it uh, are much more powerful just by the nature of the rarity of their their resource, right? Only one dude in a hundred square miles can fireball. His name is Tim the Enchanter. I love Tim the Enchanter. <laughs> exactly, yeah. In, in Monty Python, Tim is a god, essentially, because uh, the, the king is a, a dope walking around with a coconut hat. Yeah, so people wanted to have another Warlord book, and I, I wanted to make one, but I didn't want to make a, another apocalyptic book, so um, we went with this. I got a team of awesome designers who are uh, much more diverse than I originally realized, Ooh. so I was really pleased about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've been working on it since January, and now we've got this book that's ninety five percent written. And so this is a world where spellcasters bad. Uh, spellcasters just bad. So the way <laughs> the way I would view it is that like it's bad to have too many. Uh, so like the the recommended uh, party composition in the the like splash opening of the book is like one caster at most because uh, if you are a spellcaster, the various warlords who like hear about a spellcaster will come and try to get you because yeah. uh the spellcasters are the people who ultimately become locuses of power so like they're just trying to deal with a threat before it's oh okay what if i do a party of like uh, uh druids they're a little bit more tolerated you're, you're just all um, druids because you're just a cabal or you're you are the local traveling circle of druids yeah you could i mean you'd still be putting targets on your back but it wouldn't be as big a target as if you were that's sorcerer. because you can turn into a mouse and it's very hard to get a target on the back of a mouse. Is that your thinking? Yes. Or a spider. Or yeah. Anything sufficiently small. Yes. Yeah. Net. Same thing for like rangers and druids because they just don't get very high level magic. So like the the amount of supernatural uh, effect they can have in the world is more limited. I mean, druid druids can get some really powerful magic. Rangers, on the other hand, yeah, not really. No. Yeah, ranger spell list is not great. tiny. It's just like a paladin. Um, on the other hand, how about bards? Because bards technically have magic, but a lot of like their actual bardic abilities are not technically magic. Yeah, it's mentioned that if you can be on the sly about your magic, that yeah, go for it. Because I mean, bard can just play, play some music, and you're like, oh, I feel like really courageous now. But uh, you know, a cunningly built sorcerer should be able to hide their abilities for a while too. Yeah, I mean, as long as they're not mm -hmm. like shooting fireballs and spitting flames and all that fun stuff. That would be me. Precisely. If you look on like the first page of rules on the primer. You'll see there's a list of restricted spells. So, like, one of the things about Vast Caveat that I wanted to fix, how easy it is to hand wave everything about just surviving, right? Like, oh, yeah, no, I'll just conjure food. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're, what, six days into the dungeon? Sure, let me just cast Create Water. And, and like, that, there's none of that shit going on. I mean, to be, so to be fair with 5th E, at least, you, you don't typically 
have to take an eight hour rest every time you run out of spells. And with a spellcaster light party as well, uh, you won't have to rest nearly as often, I feel. But when you rest, you're not going to be able to just like run up a rope into an extra dimensional hole nobody can find. Damn! Like that spell's been removed from the game, or you have to pay a whole bunch of components to do so it. So here's another question on that uh, low magic-esque uh, setting with low magic and uh, all that fun stuff. Um, how do you handle, like, clerics and healing, then? Good luck. Be, be smart about your fights. So this is a this is a great campaign setting if I just want to play a fighter. I'll be perfectly you fine. You can play other things, yeah. dude. Yeah. There, I mean, you could totally play, a, like, well, a battle cleric. That'd be great. And the other half of it is that, like, we built the thing to be very modular, because uh, I found in my career now of making campaign setting that not everybody wants to drop their campaign setting that they've been working on with their group and, like, developing for years. So, like, sure. don't. Uh, just take the Warlords out of this book. It's a book with, like, 100-plus NPCs. Ooh. So, like, you can just increase your, your, you know, how much is in your toolbox. There's even, at the end of this primer, uh, there's a page with suggestions on, like, how to include Kalar the Lizard Lord into a regular medieval fantasy uh, world. Last night, I finished the copy for the 29 Wasteland and Miss of Akuma versions of that page, and then I have another one to do. Not only do we want you to take it in your world, we give you advice on how to do it. That's handy, because if you left it to me, nothing would look right. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, you have warlords that show up. Hey, I'll be your waiter tonight. Half these guys are cannibals, so... Oh, well then, yeah, that takes on a whole new emphasis on your party goes to a tavern. Everyone's expecting you. Everybody is to be our guest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really, um, I'm really looking forward to that rat in a cellar mission. Nope. <laughs> nope. That's not happening. They have prepared a bath for you, even. A heated bath in a large black tub in the center of the tavern. Yeah. Perfect. What's for dinner? You... Okay, yeah, that's exactly what would happen in my campaign. If we were to look at uh, Vascavia as a as a campaign setting, if we were to look at it uh, in terms of, like, Forgotten Realms, you know, Faerun, that kind of thing, what is the really big difference in the landscape? Like, what, what looks different between a, a typical D&D setting uh, that we're used to and the Vascavia setting? Okay, so if you imagine... Uh, that your screen, like your monitor in front of you, mm -hmm. uh, had a planet on it, like a you know big-ass circle. Mm -hmm. Put your thumb up to it, and look at your thumbnail, and that would be the size of uh, the North American continent. Sure. And the circle would be the planet of Vascavia, because it is super huge. Yeah. It's like uh, as big as, or bigger than the biggest planetary body we've ever seen, which is uh, Andromeda Beta, or something like Andromeda Kappa B. But it's thirteen. It's, it's, it's impossibly huge, is my point. Okay. It's so big that like there aren't even myths of creatures going all the way around it because it's just so big. The real drive in it are uh, exploration rules. So like that's one of the reasons we don't have a map. I mean, in addition to it being so big, is that each everybody's vast caveat should be different. Okay. So, like you, you find a new region, you go over the top hill, you look out, and the DM rolls. Uh, I think it's d8s determine like what you see in front of you whether it's arctic or badlands or coast or desert or forest grassland mountain swamp etc right uh and then there's also all these inhospitable terrains because it is supposed to be this like harsh ass world mm. so like you'll run into corrosive marshes and dust flats and frozen tundra and like gaseous waters with like like gas bubbles in them that you know might put you to sleep or poison you or give you disease Plains that are just, like, scorched by the sun, salt deserts, storm seas, volcanic fields. Real tough things to get through. Although, if you do get through them, the GM's supposed to reward you. Yeah, that yeah. would be the difference. Is that it's it's an unmapped and untamed wilderness that you're going to uh, tame as, as part. Oh, and, like, nice. hopefully build settlements and, and, and start a civilization. Oh, so there is a, a methodology to try and build settlements to actually start something. Absolutely. I already did that with our uh, wasteland, and this is like a refined extension of that in a, a more traditional fantasy way, oh. as opposed to a science fiction-y way. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that, that was something that I was uh, curious about. Like, uh, compared to when I look at a, a, a map of, like, Forgotten Realms, there's a lot of different, like, towns and cities and stuff. I imagined that the world of Vascavia probably is not that organized into larger civilizations, that, that they'd be smaller oh, tribes. Oh, Lord, no. Uh, so trying to build your own seems like it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, and every region you find has a certain amount of like manpower or natural resources or supernatural resources, and then the GM has a table they can roll on to randomly determine, like, okay, so you got like 
six manpower in this region of Grassland. Sure. Uh, I'll roll on this table six times. We got a dwarven clans that are hidden underground. There's tribe barbarians. There's some commoners accused of witchcraft that are like outcasts. There's a family of defeated warriors looking for safety and a small band of farmers protected by like a retired warrior. And those are the manpower resources you can try to either intimidate or persuade or bribe into joining your settlement there. Sure. And here's the natural resources and here's like the supernatural one. And they all affect how that settlement's like own like little character sheet looks like. What I like about that system is that you've essentially and I I can't remember if we've talked about something like this on the show or not, or if it was just in my head. The idea that you could take a tabletop variant of creating like a procedurally generated world. Uh because that's what mm-hmm. that's what this feels like. You know, you you are procedurally generating the world uh in a tabletop setting. Was that the intent? Yeah, man. You got it. You got it in one. I rarely get it in one, but I'm glad that I got it now. <laughs> That's what we were doing with um, 29 and Wasteland, but like it's 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 all modeled off of you know basically fantasy Fallout. It, the, the three axes upon which it works are um, a little different in the Wasteland. In, yeah, technology. Instead of supernatural, it's technology in the Wasteland. There is none. Well, yeah, no, Vascavia doesn't have any. But yeah, each... Resource adds to either order, security, appeal, or necessities. And then um, there's a, like when when terrible weather events or attacks by warlord stuff happen, uh, the better your settlement's attributes are, the better they can weather through uh, the, the the challenge. So as you start to build up your civilization, then like troubles, I imagine, start coming to your doorstep. Yeah, warlords will try to take your people. Good. Oh yeah. <laughs> no. A no. Lot no, Alex, that's not eat. good. That's that's bad. Them to enslave. Yeah, we don't want that. No, I'm they're trying to steal our cat girls. No, this is not going to be a repeat of Nipton. No, we're not going to do this. A quick segue though, Mike. Um, are you familiar with a game called uh, Thea: The Awakening? This is a deep cut. Uh, um, no, I'm not familiar okay, with Thea. Okay, looks neat though. Yeah. Well, what what it is, and this is the it, it's based on like a Slavic mythology. And it is a turn-based strategy game, sort of in the vein of, like, Civilization, but with giants and and monsters from, like, the Eastern European bloc, where you have a procedurally generated map on a hex grid, and uh, you have the one uh, town that you have to manage the resources for and build up a civilization on, and you have a collection of resources around you, and you're basically trying to make sure that your your town doesn't get overrun by all the monsters that are around you. And so a part of me was like, oh, yeah, this kind of reminds me a little bit of that, because that's, that's like a, an older mythological setting and uh, one specific place you're trying to build up and uh, and turn into something and build up your characters and, and the like. Yeah, this looks like it's a little more uh, like uh, further into the Iron Age. Like, uh, yes. Mascavia sort of like is is Bronze Age burgeoning into Iron. This is like yeah. near the end of the Iron Age. But yeah, it looks cool. The- Thea is definitely further further in. But that whole idea of just building up like your one, like your your civilization and trying to make sure that something doesn't come and destroy it made me think of, of that kind of uh, idea. Yeah, no, it's a good game if anybody gets around to playing it, but it's no one's ever heard of it. It's one of the it's like a small, small developer from over in Eastern Europe that makes those. And no one's ever heard of it. There, you're talking about a bestiary too, a very large bestiary. Mm-hmm. Where were your inspirations for that bestiary in the game? What kind of animals? What kind of monsters can we expect to see? Okay, well, so like a lot of those NPCs are are worked throughout the the, the warlord entries, right? Because each warlord entry is like, here's your baseline uh, minion, here's your slightly upgraded minion, here's your lieutenant minion, and then here's the warlord. Mm-hmm. So there's 20 warlords, ergo, there's uh, 80 NPCs in the warlord section. Mm. Um, and then the bestiary is, right now, I think 30 creatures. Uh, some of them are, like, um, drawn out of uh, Scandinavian myth. So, like, the Isaks, the Forverse Groupie, the Laupa are all um, stuff that I wrote for Ian Sider a while ago. And Ian Sider's great. If you're not familiar with Ian Sider, I'm the editor for Ian Sider. It's from Ian World. It's Patreon. You can pay, like, a dollar a month to get access to this insane archive of like uh we're coming up on article 300 now Ooh, wow. um yeah nice. and it's great to write for because like what yen world does is they they pay for exclusive rights to your work for a year and then uh then you can do whatever you want with it 
So, oh, nice. like, I did these monsters more than a year ago. They're mine. I'm going to reprint them in this book if they're appropriate. So, yeah, there's, some of those just came the Nuda Draugr, yeah, right out of, right out of myth. Mm. Um, and then, like I said, there are the mainstay um, sort of protagonist the NPCs, the Master of the Jungle and the Barbarian Thief. And then others, just stuff I thought would be cool, like a wolf that was gargantuan sized, a mega wolf. Oh, who doesn't mega want wolf. a mega wolf? Right? Ultra dire wolf. Mm -hmm. The Pachicoli, which is a sort of like um, a more uh, 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 OSR Deathclaw from Fallout. Oh, good big old mm. chameleon lizard. So just like a super alpha predator. Uh, drop lizards, so or drop dinosaurs. I'm sorry, drop dinosaurs. Uh, which are exactly what they sound like. I'm amazed there wasn't actually a drop dinosaur of some kind, but now there there will be a new one. Oh, okay. Uh, so, like, are, are those, like, drop bears, but as dinosaurs? Yeah, kind of like drop bears. Oh, okay. Except, yeah. except yeah, dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah except There's dinosaurs. There's no talk about, what is it, Vegemite? There's no talk about Vegemite for the, the Plumetusaurus. Oh. Um, yeah, it is essentially like a drop bear. Missed opportunity. There's a couple other dinosaurs, and then there's a suite of devastation creatures, which are meant to be uh, sort of like um, an unpleasant realization for parties. <laughs> like, everybody who's played D&D &D for a while has fought a cockatrice, and a gargoyle, and a giant, and a mm. griffin. So, like, you're going to roll up on this thing, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I know what to do with minotaurs. And if you don't make your perception check, or don't have a high enough passive perception, you don't realize that it's, like, this subtly warped and mutated version of a Minotaur. Oh. Uh, in which case, it can do a bunch of terrible stuff. It can make you more susceptible to fear, and then also inspire said fear. Its blade can spawn Minotaur skeletons uh, whenever it kills something, and it feels it whenever it strikes. So, like, yeah, it's, it's meant to be, like, uh, throwing players off their game. Yeah, because, like, you need to feel that sense of wonder and awe and fear while you're going through Vascavia to, to set the right tone for the the types of stories you want the campaign setting. Tis just a small rabbit. <laughs> but it jumps like and it has teeth like. Run away! Run away! <laughs> you soiled me armor. Oh my god, the rabbit. You should probably get a tinker in here. Yeah. I really need I really need a dire rabbit. It's a vorpal rabbit. Oh. Hold on, hold on just a second and I will hook you up. Oh boy. Okay. Oh, perfect. There you go. I just uh, dropped a jackalope link in the Discord. Jackalope. Oh, not a perfect. waffle tinger. Oh, oh, that yeah. is a waffle tinger. It's Does a it waffle. Oh yeah. I love that it has a dexterity of twenty one. <laughs> They're fast. They are. But if you look at the design notes, I have uh, uh, directions on how to use it, like in Monty Python, and a uh, link to a holy hand grenade. Oh, that's nice. great. Nice. I want this to be my pet. Your attack rabbit. I, I I want an attack rabbit as my. Well, <laughs> funny you should mention that because one of the uh, class options in Vascavia is to play a monster tamer, and you could definitely tame a jackalope. Perfect. Oh no, I'll take it back. I take it back. I'm sorry. The jackalope has an intelligence of eight. Monster tamer can't do stuff. Why would it have five. an intelligence? Oh, eight. above oh, five. Oh darn. That's too. But they're bad. pretty smart, man. That's yeah. ridiculous. It should not be as smart as a human. I mean, it's slightly dumber than a human. Like it's a it's a dumb human. It's still smarter than like a, a fifth grader. <laughs> I mean, it's smart enough to like whiskey. Well, I don't know. We have to take that to Jeff Foxworthy. Let's. T <laughs> Who wants to play? Are you smarter than a jackalope? <laughs> Let's see. Let's see what we got going on now. New game show coming to ABC. Welcome to Are You Smarter Than a Jackalope? Coming to ABC this fall. ABC. We've run out of ideas. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> The, the, but the thing about that is, like, you were mentioning a minotaur and the idea of a minotaur being so... I, I wanted to play a minotaur for D&D. &D. Everyone wants to play a minotaur. Of course you do! Why wouldn't you? <laughs> Minotaurs are great! I mean, you sound like you're being a little bullheaded about it. So. It's no bull. I wanted to be a minotaur. <laughs> but now, the thing about it is, I keep thinking to myself, like, what if I'm a minotaur and I come across, like, uber minotaur? Am I going to be able to try and reason my way out of this? Or is no, it... if you come across, if you're a minotaur and you come across an uber minotaur, then you just got beef. My cloven hoofs overflow. Yeah, so I I keep thinking to myself like this must be very interesting with like the uh, the monster classes that you normally oh, could play. You, you know what, Nathan, you should do sometime uh, instead of being a minotaur, you should be a miniator. So you're <laughs> a minotaur with dwarfism. Oh, okay. So you're like normal size, not large. You know what I would do? I would uh, uh, dig up from the Delve archives the Mimator and be a be a Minotaur 
that has that basically worked as a mime and it is a mimator. I think that people would actually prefer that because it means the minotaur doesn't talk. That would probably be better for everybody. I mean, they they can't talk. No, a miniator. Okay. It'll be a, a medium to small based minotaur. I don't. I, 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 <laughs> I don't know why those don't exist. You know what that reminds me of? If you were looking at like Fallout lore, the toaster. Okay. Uh, yeah, from from Old World Blues. No, oh, no, no one. No. Yeah, the toaster in the like little like uh hangout area in where the you, sink, like your your sleeping area in the yeah. super scientist DLC. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the old world, didn't play that one. Oh, it was the best. That one. was the best. Well, um, it's hard to say. I assume it was a sentient. It was really good. No, it was, it was the a best. really good <laughs> toaster. Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah. Out of four DLCs, it was the best. You would put in these AI chips to every all these different components in in the sink, and uh, one of them was a toaster. And you put the you put the the personality matrix into the toaster. The toaster is so pissed off at everything <laughs> immediately and wants to destroy the world. <laughs> he's he's very distraught that the world already went through an apocalypse because he wanted to bring about the apocalypse. <laughs> and he feels like the job was done without his consent. <laughs> he is very upset. Little tiny toaster on the middle that can't really do anything but really wants to destroy the world. That sounds like what a miniator would be. No, Nathan, that's a toaster. A minitoaster. Anyway, the the Minotoaster <sighs> is the newest character for Voskavi. But now now that we've we've talked about that though, if if I'm not talking about being a a, a Minotoaster or a Miniator, what kind of races can I play that are new to Voskavia? The Miniator. Oh. No. <laughs> uh no, there's no Miniator. No. We do have a couple new races. The classic would be the Bogarts are available to play as the like toad folk. And then oh. also um, mongrel folk, uh, which in the older editions of D and D were mongrel men uh, for really nonsensically misogynistic reasons. Uh, mongrel hmm. folk are like weird hybrid humanoids, and and I I want to stress the weird part. So like you might have an arm that belongs to a, a bird, you might have a leg that would fit on a primate, and another leg that would look better on a dinosaur. So like they're oh. these weird mishmash humanoids. So those those are the Ooh. classic ones, and then there's uh, also a dinosaur race called the Tino Car, and like a race of like plant like folk called the Ally, and then also insects uh, called the Kanka. Oh, wow. and then the weirdest one are the Utini, which are my favorite. Really? Uh, the Utini are are psychic parasites. So like you kind of like <laughs> you find a corpse, you inhabit that corpse, it comes back to life while you're hosting while it's your host. And then when you hit two death saves, uh, you can either, like, hope to pull out of it and maybe die, or you can change into a psionic cloud in the same way that a vampire changes when they hit zero hit points, and then go look for another corpse to inhabit. Nice. That can be beneficial. Do you get the racial bonuses of the corpse? You do not. Uh, Otini get their own racial bonuses. So if I have the corpse of, like, a troll, I don't get, like, a troll's strength and everything? Uh, trolls are giants, I think, not humanoid. They're, that's still, it's still a humanoid. It's a humanoid mm. giant. They're the subtype of humanoid. No, giants are their own type in 5e. Are they? What? Yeah. Ab- still subtype. <laughs> so, you wouldn't be able to get a troll. I mean, if I was the GM, I would let you be a troll, because there are large races in Vascavia, and you can't change the size of a of a race. Right. But, um, you wouldn't get the, the regeneration, no. Ah, no. oh, darn. I didn't want the regeneration. I wanted the... the utter strength um no no you keep your traits uh what do you get you get telepathy you you get cool stuff in exchange for that like a you get the ability to to pop out of there really quick and you like like you did for the last corpse you inhabit well i mean i was just thinking like some of the special abilities or special like traits of the not even like the regeneration or anything but like it has dark vision. I'm using its eyes, so I have dark vision, right? Oh, teeny have dark vision. Oh, oh, well, so perfect. Just, that was just an example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your size and speed are determined by your host race. But now, see, this is what I would do if I was in a toonie. I would wait until there was a warlord, and then I would kill the warlord, and then I would inhabit the warlord. <laughs> if I do, but if I do that, can I command the warlord's armies? I mean, if they don't know that he's dead and that you're inhabiting his body, why wouldn't you be able That's to? That's the plan. Yeah, no, saying. I mean, if you manage to pull a pull a Freaky Friday on a Warlord, go for it, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely what I'm doing. <laughs> Although, perfect. There yeah. is there is a tell. So, like, after um, you've... 
possess the body for a 1d4 months plus your proficiency bonus. Whenever you take damage, you bleed this unnatural yellow-green ooze from your, your orifices. That sounds sticky. And oh. then at, if you manage to make it through that without anyone noticing, after a number of years equal to your proficiency bonus, you start to, like, runes and weird glyphs start to glow from under your skin. So oh. there is, a like, a limit on how long you can be a host. Any, anything can host you. That would definitely be a, a red flag. Um, <laughs> no, you just dyed your blood. Well, I mean, you could try to come up with any excuse. If you get, who knows? I drink a lot of pineapple juice, guys. It <laughs> depends on how stupid the people around you are. <laughs> exactly, you know? and it, and it's this world where knowledge isn't widely shared. So, like, you could just yeah. claim that you have a sickness or something. You know, I've got the pox, or I'm one of those people with yellow, yellowish blood. Do you not know the myths of our people that exonerate those with the yellow blood? So, hey, you know what? You make a couple, like, charisma saves or something, you can probably get through that. In the in the book, the, every chapter opens up with a, a fiction element, like a short story. And then the warlord sections also have their own fiction elements with these four different parties of adventurers that you can follow along. And one of them has an Utuni who is, like, hiding that they are an Otuni. And, like, they, oh, the, the rest of uh, their party members only realize it, like, at the very end as they're all dying and, like, the, the, the halfling monk's eyes are like closing as she sees this weird cloud float out of the, the ear canal of her dead elven friend and like towards her and you know, mm. she's about to be a possessed corpse. Here, here's a really quick question for that. Do they retain the memories of their host? They do. So they have advantage Ooh. on intelligence history check. Oh, good. Nice. Okay, cool. And if a host race grants proficiencies, you do get uh, those proficiencies like as a racial feature. I have proficiency in not being found out that I'm a psychic parasite. Well, There's I mean, you'll that. get a charisma boost from being an Otuni, so... But now, here's the question, though. Uh, do they still have the memories of previous hosts? Yeah, I would say so. Now all I have to do is just find corpses from, like, every civilization we come across, and I will be the font oh, of knowledge. Oh, do they soak up mem- No, they don't soak up memories. They don't soak up memories. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean... You don't have to soak them up, but you could keep a journal. Yeah, you could keep a journal. Yes, yeah. you keep your own memories from, like... Yeah. Oh, okay. The idea is that they become repositories of history in this world where there is no, like, real written word and, and like, libraries and stuff. I'm actually kind of interested in, in plant like When you said the plant like a lie, uh, just because, like, plant-like races are really... Uh, I, I have not seen those really in d and I mean, by itself. Nathan, like, yeah. most of the fae are plant-like races. Really? Well, I, they're plant-like in the way that Vegapygmy are plant-like. Boggarts are kind of plant-like. Oh, Boggarts aren't plant-like. What are you talking about? They're, they're fae. They're totally plant-like. They're not they're plant people. creatures. <laughs> they're fae. They're they're fae totally are... I, I would say fae are more like fairies and... Uh, Dryads are uh, fae. Satyrs are also fae. I mean, Trents would be like a plant-like race, but... They are, they are magical plants. Yeah. A lie are more like Treon. Oh, okay. I, I mean, they're small-sized. I want to so. make a lie, and I want to name him Cake, because the cake is a lie. I don't have the slide whistle to punctuate that, um, but but no, I I am totally behind playing a a treant. So uh, if the ally are like that, um, I'm you just want to play Groot. Yes, you'd be playing Baby Groot because they're small sides. Oh, there they're Baby Groots. Okay, well that's fine. Baby Groot's still useful. Does the Baby Groot ally have to um have to eat, or do you just get all of your uh energy through like the sun? Uh, you don't need to sleep or eat. Uh, you Perfect. do need to sleep if you do not have access to sunlight, soil, and water. Oh. So you have to spend like four hours a day doing a sort of meditation, kind of like an elf, where you like just root down uh-huh. and you know suck up nutrients. Oh, okay. And then because you don't have proper blood, you have uh, sap throwing, flowing through what, xylem and phloem tubes. Oh, nice. Um, you only die when you hit your fourth bad death save. Like, oh, okay. No bleeding out for you. So they're not subjected to like uh, a rend. They can't like bleed out. So I mean, like eh, it would it would fall to the GM and the specific wording of it. But they don't have blood. So if the feature or a trait or attack requires the target to have blood, uh, then it wouldn't affect an ally. If it was just like has to be a living target, I would, as the GM say, it probably. Wouldn't. Are they uh, subject to critical hits then? They are still subject to critical hits. Mm. Okay. I mean, I figured, but that's one of those things where if they don't have, like, a discernible anatomy, for instance, 
But I'm guessing like I bleeding damage is is a no. Like I wouldn't take bleeding damage. Sap is really gummy. Yeah. Again, it would depend on the specific wording, but yeah, I think for the most part that would probably be okay. So hey, benefits abound. Um, but yeah, no. Besides, like what we're we're talking about, Alex says that the Fey are basically like plants, and that's a, that's his call. But <laughs> they are like plants. But, They're very plant-like. They are very nature-oriented. Yeah, but when I think about plants, I think of something literally coming out of the ground, like as a plant. I mean, dryads come out of trees, so that's pretty sweet. But I like the idea of actually having a a, a plant like a tree. Well, Alex, would you say that ants are fey? No, because those are in the. I mean, I would if you're gonna lump like big groups of creatures together, I would say they're fey-like, but they are actually like magical creatures. They're magical plants, so it's slightly different. I, I mean, are they intelligent? Yeah, they're typically pretty intelligent, right? Yeah, ants are intelligent. They just talk really slow. I wonder if they cry a lot if they're weeping willows. Okay, well, but moving like, on. As far as like group classifications aside from plant, I would I would totally toss a, a tree with a, a fey type creatures like dryads and nymphs and and all those. They things. could live in my canopy. They can like just hang. Yeah, out. you could have a, you could have a large tree that's got like a a, a house on his in his uh, yeah. limbs. That'd be cool. Well, sure. Interestingly, we have a uh, like one of the bestiary, one of the monsters in the primer actually is this thing called the um. That's a nature card, and it is kind of like an earth elemental slash tree, and I decided to type it as an elemental instead of a fey or plant. Oh. Because it's a force of the elements, right? It's meant yeah, to be the right. elements personified into, like, a humanoid shape. I'm building my baby Groot right now. I want to thank Mike Myler for coming on to talk about Vast Cavia. We haven't had him on the show for a while, and we ended up talking to him for a very long time. Uh, there's a lot to talk about because, of course, Cavia is vast. It's right there in the title, folks. So we are going to have more about the world that he created and also the uh, subclasses, the different classes that you can play, some of the monsters that you'll encounter on the next episode which will be releasing right around the same time it goes live on Game on Tabletop. No, we're not on Kickstarter this time. We are actually on Game on Tabletop. And Mike will talk a little bit more about that platform for crowdfunding and his experience with them. I think you're going to find that very interesting if you are thinking about having a campaign of your own. It may be an option for you. Stay tuned for that. If you want to find out more information about Game on Tabletop, go to GameOnTabletop.com. If you want to get more information on Vast Cavia, you can go to VastCavia.com. This is pretty straightforward, folks. It's not, they're not making it hard for you to find this information. It's really quite simple. And, of course, if you want to find anything more about what we do over on Delve, go to DelveCast.com. Please click on the Patreon banner. While you're there, you can get extended interviews. Actually, the entire interview that we did, unedited, uncut, is up there right now. So you can enjoy the whole thing if you are so inclined. You can find us on basically every podcast that was ever conceived of by human beings, including iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Yep, every single one you can imagine. And do not forget to follow us on Twitter. I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And if you want to follow along with more of what uh, Mike does, you can follow him on Twitter, at MikeMyler2. And you can also go to his website, specifically MikeMyler.com, because uh, as he talks about in the next episode, he, uh, he comes up with a lot of interesting supplemental material that he just wanted to exist in the world, and he throws a lot of that up there. So worth checking out. And until the next episode, where we get even further into Vast Cavia, because it's vast, folks. That's like right in the title. I want to thank you all for listening, and we will see you on the next episode. Bye, everyone.